to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I, I will admit, I gave a little bit of a preview last night at the um, newcomer's dinner, some of us sitting around the fire pit outside, and said, well, you know, there are lots of different ways of preaching, lots of different modes. W- one that I've not done here is really more the catechetical teaching side. I, I like to save the teaching for outside of the, the service. And yet, sometimes on special days like today, the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, it can be quite helpful, I think, to have some common language and terminology. Some of you who have been around St. James for quite a while might remember uh, Father Ross Stuckey, our Rector Emeritus, who often would have um, handouts for his sermons that were fill in the blank. It was a way to make sure you were paying attention and were listening. In fact, and Father Ross, if you see this recording, uh, bless you, thank you, Um, there are entire membership binders in the office we still have copies of, an inch and a half, two inches thick, that are all the about St. James, and they're all fill in the blank. You could learn all about it, but you had to do the work. There are no fill in the blanks on this sheet, but I did want to um, acknowledge that you have it. We will come back to it here in a bit. But today, being the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, which only falls on a Sunday, depending on leap years and this, that, and the other, every six, seven, sometimes ten years apart. So it's a very special treat that we get um, to spend a Sunday focused on a topic we don't, oddly enough, talk about in church too terribly often, and that's the angels. We reference angels throughout the liturgy. We say at, um, in communion that we're joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. And we hear about the angels, but when do we stop and think and reflect on them? Actually, just this week, um, yesterday even, um, I was talking to my husband, Joe, who is also a priest. And I was just saying, you know, I can't remember the last time I just stopped and thought about angels. And he says, who does that? Um, It's like, okay, good. I'm not alone. And I thought perhaps for us today, it would be helpful to spend a few moments thinking about um, God's creatures, the angels, those we don't see. I will say there is good news in in this. There is good news in the angels. We are reminded of the mysterious, yes, but the many ways that God reaches out to us, that God shows love and care for us in ways that we don't often see, in ways that we're often not mindful of, and yet, even then, when we're not, even when we're not thinking, oh, how is God trying to communicate? How is God showing love or working in my life? Sometimes we have to stop and remember the angels. Now, many of us have images of angels. They're they're not uncommon in the world in terms of, well, Christmas decorations. We often see them around the Feast of St. Michael. You might see a bronze statue or silver of um, St. Michael with a sword slaying a dragon or something of the sort. Um, It looks like just a a human creature with wings. And, And you know, depictions of angels are not unique to Christianity. I mean, many cultures for thousands of years have had some version of of an angel, of some divine messenger, sometimes even with wings. I think, though, the image that sticks in my mind most clearly is the image I grew up with because my little sister's bedroom when she was born, and there's quite the age gap between us, was all precious moments. It was all just these little baby angels floating on clouds all around. And then when I hear stories like we heard today um, from Genesis, from Revelation, I don't often think about the little happy babies floating on clouds. And yet, how are we to understand angels? What image might we have of them? Truly, images fail us. Angels, these spiritual creatures, are beyond even our imagination something we can image. They are God's creatures that are purely spirit. How can we conceive of that? It's not unlike trying to think of, well, then what does God look like? If God is spirit, if God is invisible to our eyes, 
And yet, we also know that God comes to us in Christ, that we see God at work in the world in many ways. And that sometimes opens our imagination to the work of angels in our midst. Now, like I, like I said, this handout, I was going to come back to it without looking at any of the words at the moment, just the pictures in the middle. I, with my own two eyes, have n- never seen a Christmas tree topper that um, looked like any of these three. And yet, and yet, um, when we hear about the seraphs, the seraphim um, in Isaiah, those who were around the throne singing, holy, 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 When we hear of the cherubim, and often cherubs we think of as that little baby angel, and that comes through classical Western art, but we won't get into an art lesson today. Um, But we hear of cherubs in Genesis guarding the Garden of Eden. We hear of them around the throne. We hear of them in God's heavenly presence with four wings and four different kind of faces of different creatures. And then we hear like we sang about in that hymn just a moment ago, you watchers and you holy ones, thrones, and thrones as a form of angel opening. And these, the, these chariot wheels of sorts that are spinning and ablaze, and they're going out, doing God's work. And if you notice, all three of those creatures are covered in eyes. There's the eyes of each of the heads on the cherubim. There's the eyes scattered around the thrones and the seraphim. No wonder when an angel shows up in scripture, we hear, be not afraid. (laughs) If perhaps that day, how they showed up to us, looked something like that. Sometimes it takes a reminder, be not afraid, when something inconceivable shows up in our midst. Those aren't the only images of angels, though. I referenced some that look like a human, but just so happen to have wings. Here in the, for lack of a better word, reredos, the altar screen behind us, we have on each the left and the right depictions of angels. We have um, Gabriel on the left and the uh, archangel Michael here on the right. And you can see Michael with his sword um, drawn. We see Gabriel, the one who announces to Mary, behold, you shall conceive and bear child we see him announcing there we have depictions of angels and yet sometimes we don't like to talk about them sometimes we don't (coughs) name them in our midst and yet the church has always affirmed that there are angels that there are these spiritual beings and again not just the church All of the Abrahamic religions have named this. We hear it in the Old Testament and the New. But angels, we often think, well, either we think they might look like this and they come and they they show up to announce something or they come to slay something or sometimes they just come to scare us. But angels as a whole are a whole just category of being. God is the creator God's created all kinds of things, humans and birds and trees and oceans. Yes, these things that we can see and God who is invisible to our naked eyes also can create things that might themselves be invisible to our naked eyes. Perhaps God's creation is even more creative than we can think or hope or imagine. But as creatures, angels are closer to God, it seems, you know, when we think, oh, well, they might transcend time and space. They're not bound, uh, bound up in a physical body like we are. And yet, like creatures, all, all creatures, there's some degree of free will. They have some ability to choose, to choose, yes, to say, God, my creator has called me to this holy work, and I'm going to do it. Or to say, Sorry, God, I'm not doing that anymore. Or in fact, even rebel against God. We hear about rebellious angels in the scriptures, and even that kind we don't like to talk about all too often. These ones have given different names, demons or demonic of sorts, but this category of being, this divine messenger of God that's gone astray. And when we stop and think of these categories, and we think of the angels and what all they do or what all they're capable of, we can be reminded 
that sometimes it's far too simple to focus in on only what is right in front of us, only what we can see with our eyes, that the only things that God has created are just the physical materials around us. And yet, while we might think in that category, even if we don't name it as such, well, we're here at church today. I think many of us believe in God. I believe many of us in this room will acknowledge, well, God, there's, there's something spiritual that happens at different times in our lives, perhaps even at church. It's easy to fall into the trap then to swing the pendulum the other way. So, you know, if one side is, well, everything is purely physical or spiritual, or to, to swing it the other way to say, then everything is angelic. Everything is the holy angels or it's the demons. And to leave out that middle part, perhaps even from our tradition that tries to hold in the middle so many strands of thought and belief and tradition, somewhere in the middle that names, yes, perhaps there are spiritual forces, angels we might call them, and we creatures, we humans, also have free will and ability and interact with the world. So perhaps not everything is angelic. But perhaps, perhaps the angels are all around. In fact, the church has, as it has always affirmed, the existence of angels and God's use of the angels. The church has said that the angel's job is to point us to God, to remind us of who God is. Angel, at just at its very core, that word means messenger in some way or form, whether that is spoken word like we hear from Gabriel announcing what God is doing in the world or something enacted like St. Michael slaying the dragon. They're reminding us, pointing us to God, reminding us with a message of who God is and how much God loves us. We in our lives, whether we know it or not, perhaps even interact with angels, good, bad, or otherwise. And it really struck me this week, thinking about the role of angels in prayer and how the angels join us, perhaps even lifting our prayers to heaven or come and God, when we ask God for something, and God might send an angel to enact it. And on Thursday night with Compline, I'm thinking about angels, perhaps, that do go astray and rebel Trying to lead Compline, my internet went out the moment Compline was supposed to start. And by the time we got it all rebooted and the whole thing up, my download speed, I could, I could learn things. I could text and know what, what was happening. Yo, no, the feed's not coming through. But my upload speed was non-existent. There was nothing to let the prayers move out. Now, whether that was angelic, demonic, if you will, I'm not going to say one way or the other. I don't know for sure. It was certainly on my mind. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps there were forces that didn't want us to pray. The angels do a lot, though. The angels do help in our prayers. They draw us to God. And just to refer back to, to this sheet, I've listed here the different kinds of angels we hear about in Scripture, how the church has understood or conceived of them. This, the angels that, yes, do join us in prayer. If you go to that last category, the angels or the watchers, really the, the lowest down the list, the church has, as many of us have found, found ourselves saying at different times, said that there is some guardian angel, someone watching out for us. And so we call them watchers, like the hymn we just sang, ye watchers and ye holy ones. Sometimes angels show up, like we hear in the Gospels, like the two young men robed in white at the tomb. And they show up, they look very human and yet radiant with light. These angels that come and have a message for us right in our midst. There's the seraphim that are constantly singing, holy, holy, holy. And there is everything in between. Angels that are at work in the world, in the universe, in the powers and principalities. We have, like we mentioned today, the archangel Michael and a category of angels just one step up, directing the others. Again, I share all of this, this 
almost information dump in a way, to remind us to think, to be mindful of what God is doing, what is spiritual all around us that perhaps our eyes can't see but our hearts could be opened to. Perhaps even in the sacraments, like at the Holy Eucharist, when we do join our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, perhaps we are transported into, into the heavenly throne room and we do join with the saints, the prophets, the apostles and martyrs. Perhaps the angels join us or we, in fact, join them in their song as we sing holy, holy, holy. And we can ask God to send an angel, perhaps even the archangel Gabriel, uh, Michael, to come to defend us, to care for us, to fend off the evil. And as we prayed at the beginning of today's service, I hope we are reminded through the ministries of angels and mortals that God's holy angels serve and worship him in heaven. And they help and defend us here on earth so that we might join them in their praise. Amen. Amen.